Hello, my name is Renata Suma. I am a PhD candidate of the Institute of International Relations of Pukki Hill. Continuing the Hazel series of interviews, today I talk with Athena Colby of University of Michigan from the United States. Thank you. How is violence constituted in Haiti? What are its main expressions in this scenario? And what are the main differences between the forms of violences identified in these settings and the ones identified in war context? I see that we have um, experienced a lot of changes in the type of violence that we've had in Haiti over the past 10 years. So if we look at 2003, 2004, when we were in the midst of um, a civil war, um, much of the violence that people experienced was um, done by state actors and about half of the, the crimes, about half of the murders, and about half of the sexual assaults were committed by uh, criminals. Um, but since that time, there's been a lot of changes in terms of the development of armed groups, the um, increasing power of um, armed gangs, and the percentage of crimes that have been committed now by armed gangs rather than just by common criminals. So we see, for instance, that in the um, popular zones, which are the um, highly populated, poor neighborhoods in the urban areas, that people have a much um, greater likelihood of being a victim of a crime, um, while in the rest of the city, the crime rate has been dropping. So the crime is, is geographically concentrated, and the, the violence that people are experiencing is um, tied intimately to the political conflict within the country. So at times when um, political repression um, from the government increases against the population, membership in armed groups also increases, and subsequently we see more violence in certain neighborhoods. And at times when um, things are more peaceful and we have more stability and political stability and economic stability in the country, we see that crime decreases. Which vulnerabilities are identified in this scenario? In which sense these vulnerabilities legitimate the humanitarian action in urban contexts in Haiti? And which are the main challenges in trying to implement these practices? Well, I think if we're going to talk about humanitarian actors, that we have to look at the example of what happened in 2010. So everyone knows that in 2010 we had a, a big earthquake in Haiti and um, this was a massive humanitarian disaster and, and many people responded from all over the world. And one of the problems that we had was that there were existing social networks that prevented crime. So for instance, um, there have always been gangs in Haiti and gangs have served a protective function in some communities where um, you were not necessarily victimized because you lived in this neighborhood and the gang looked after everyone in the neighborhood and so as long as you were in your own zone you were you were pretty much okay and after the earthquake um, in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake uh, we, we had about half the population was displaced and over subsequent months um, you know people did return to their homes but a large percentage of the population lived in internally displaced persons camps or relocated to the countryside or lived with friends and so the social networks that had been protecting people were disrupted and um, as people relocated to IDP camps and um, lived in in other neighborhoods gangs had to um, sort of vie for control all over again and reestablish their dominance. And as a result of this, there was a lot of crime that happened, a lot of violence. So we saw that murder rates increased in some areas, that there was a lot of fighting between armed groups. And um, at the same time, we had humanitarian actors that were coming in and, and wanted to help. These were internationals who wanted to deliver aid and, and um, were responding to the disaster, to the earthquake, but without um, sufficient local contacts and um, without really knowing the neighborhoods and really knowing who the different groups were and who all the actors were, um, this simply coming into a neighborhood and then dumping a lot of aid and maybe making partnerships with people that were not uh, considered legitimate leaders by the community members, um, this, this it also disrupted the neighborhoods. And so we had um, some areas where NGOs were accidentally or intentionally partnering with armed groups um, 
and some armed groups emerged as uh, powerful entities in some areas because they were able to garner resources and money that were coming in as a part of the humanitarian aid. They were able to um, either steal or, or get access to resources. And so um, some groups that had um, been gangs but been relatively peaceful gangs um, that um, really acted more like social and political organizations that occasionally committed crimes were replaced by more predatory, more younger, more violent gangs that were really just organized to commit crimes and to have power and control and that didn't really respect the um, customs of, um, of protection and um, of interaction that had been established already in these communities. So I think that um, when humanitarian workers come into a neighborhood and, and come into a situation like Haiti, they need to be really mindful of, of establishing contact with people locally and, and really respecting the situation that exists already, that taking the lead from local people rather than sometimes as, um, as professionals, sometimes we want to, we think we know what the solution is, we want to come in and, and, and solve things. And I think that um, one thing that a lesson that we can all learn from the earthquake in 2010 was that um, sometimes we don't know all the answers and that, that really um, that we need to avoid causing harm by letting local people take the lead and by following um, their guidance in establishing who to work with and, um, and in respecting the existing structures of power and existing leadership um, structures that already um, we're already contributing to stability in the neighborhood. Thank you for the interview. The Hazel series continues next week. Learn more about the project at hazel.org.